better shape up, mm, 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 cause I need a man, mm, yeah. And my heart is set on you, you better shape up, mm, 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 you better understand, oh yeah. To my heart I must be true, nothing left, nothing left for me to do. Hey, you the one that I want, you are the one I want, ooh, 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 honey, you the one that I want, you are the one I want, ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> One and all, and welcome once again to Tom's Hit Parade. Yes, if you can believe it, it's time for another Backtracks already. I don't know how the months have been whizzing by so darn fast. It's just crazy, especially this year, it seems. Uh, but and there's nothing you can do to stop it, right? Time marches on, as they say. But anyway, uh, yes, Backtracks is my monthly roundup of notable album anniversaries, divisible by five, as well as at least one Spotlight album review. So let's just march right on in, shall we, and see which albums are celebrating anniversaries for the month of October 2019. Sixty years ago this month, Ornette Coleman released The Shape of Jazz to Come. It was his third album, and his first on the Atlantic label. It was also his first album with his quartet players of Don Cherry on trumpet, Charlie Hayden on bass, and Billy Higgins on drums. This quartet was notable for not featuring a chordal instrument such as a piano or a guitar, and Coleman himself was notable for playing a plastic saxophone. This early free jazz album was a landmark, and is included on the Rolling Stone magazine's list of the 500 greatest albums of all time, and was inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame in 2015. However, major jazz luminaries of the time, Miles Davis and Charles Mingus among them, were not fans of the album at first. Also released in October of 1959 was Chet Atkins' 11th album, Mr. Guitar. It included versions of standards such as Show Me the Way to Go Home, I'm Forever Blowing Bubbles, and even a Tchaikovsky piano concerto. It also features his modest hit song, Country Gentleman, co-written by Boodle Bryant. That song and the album's title both became nicknames for Atkins for the rest of his life and career. October of 1964 saw the release of The Kinks' self-titled debut album. It includes the smash hit single You Really Got Me and five other original tunes, with the rest of the album comprised of covers of rock and blues tunes like Chuck Berry's Beautiful Delilah, Bo Diddley's Cadillac, and Slim Harpo's Got Love If You Want It. Led Zeppelin's Jimmy Page played acoustic guitar on two of the album's tracks. For its U.S. release, the album was shortened by three songs and retitled You Really Got Me. Also celebrating its 55th anniversary this month is Simon & Garfunkel's debut album Wednesday Morning 3 AM. It featured renditions of Bob Dylan's The Times They Are Changin' and the traditional hymn Go Tell It on the Mountain. But the most popular song on the album was, of course, The Sounds of Silence. The album was originally a flop causing the duo to go their separate ways. Simon moved to London and Garfunkel re-enrolled at Columbia University until the following summer, when the growing radio popularity of Sounds of Silence belatedly kick-started their careers. The single eventually hit number one on the Billboard Hot 100 in January of 1966, and the album peaked at number 30 on the Billboard 200 in February of 1966, more than a year after their original release. Half a century ago, King Crimson released their debut album In the Court of the Crimson King. It peaked at number 28 on the Billboard 200, number 27 in Canada, and number 5 in the UK. Initial reviews of the album were decidedly mixed. One esteemed critic called it ersatz shit, but it's now regarded as a prog rock classic. Rolling Stone declared it the second greatest prog rock album of all time, behind Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. One not-so-trivial trivia note, Technical problems during mixing and misplacement of the original masters forced all subsequent issues of the album to be made from lesser quality second generation copies until the masters were finally unearthed in 2003. Another debut album turning 50 years old this month is Offering by the Carpenters. They wouldn't make their big splash until their follow-up album, and as such, this one differs considerably from their subsequent releases. The duo perform nearly all the instruments themselves on this album, and the vocal duties are evenly shared by Karen and Richard. Karen would do nearly all the lead vocals from then on. They had minor success with the ballad-arranged cover of the Beatles' Ticket to Ride, and after the success of their second album, this album was renamed after that song and re-released. Happy 45th anniversary this month to Billy Joel's third album, Street Life Serenade. Pressured for a follow-up to his hit album, Piano Man, his busy tour schedule left him little time to write new songs, which is one reason why this album contains two instrumental tracks. It peaked at number 16 in Canada and number 35 in the US, where it eventually earned platinum certification. It was his first album to make use of the Moog synthesizer. The only official single from the album, The Entertainer, was a top 40 hit in the US. The back cover photo of uh, Billy Joel was taken two days after he had his wisdom teeth pulled, hence his rather unhappy expression. Also released in October of 1974 was Roland, the debut album by the Bay City Rollers. It produced three top ten singles in the UK, 
the number two hit Shangalang, number three Summer Love Sensation, and number six Remember Shalalala. All three singles also went top 20 in Ireland. The album was never released in the U.S., but several of its tracks would appear on their U.S. debut the following year, one of which, Saturday Night, would become a number one U.S. hit, though it was never released as a single in the U.K. Four decades ago this month, Madness released their debut album One Step Beyond. It spent a year on the U.K. album's chart, picking it number two. It was also a top 20 album in Austria, Sweden, and Germany. It produced two top 10 singles in the U.K., One Step Beyond and My Girl. The Prince reached number 16 on the UK singles chart. That song serves as a tribute to Jamaican ska artist Prince Buster, and the band covers two of Buster's hits on the album, the title track and Madness. October of 1979 also saw the release of Kenny Loggins' third album, Keep the Fire. It peaked at number 16 on the Billboard 200 out of 43 weeks on the chart. It's best known for its hit single, This Is It, which peaked in the top 20 on three different Billboard charts, number 11 on the Hot 100, number 17 on the Adult Contemporary chart, and number 19 on the Hot Soul Singles chart. The song also earned Loggins a Grammy for Best Male Pop Vocal Performance. Michael McDonald co-wrote and sings backing vocals on This Is It, and the album track Who's Right, Who's Wrong features Michael Jackson and Mr. Mr.'s Richard Page on backing vocals. 35 years ago this month, Shaka Khan released her fifth solo album, I Feel For You. It reached the number four spot on the Billboard R&B Albums chart, and number 16 on the Billboard 200, and number 15 in the UK. The title track, a cover of a 1979 Prince song, featured Grandmaster Melly Mel of Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five and Stevie Wonder, and was Khan's biggest hit, spending half a year on the Billboard Hot 100 and peaking at number three and topping the Billboard R&B and Dance Songs charts. The song also won a Grammy for Best Female R&B Vocal Performance. The follow-up single, This Is My Night, also hit number one on the Billboard Dance chart, and Through the Fire was a top 20 hit on the Adult Contemporary Singles chart. Also released in October of 1984 was Wham's sophomore album, Make It Big. It topped the album's charts in 10 countries, including the US, the UK, Canada, Australia, and Japan. And by the time of its 10th anniversary, it had been certified six times platinum in the US. Four successful singles were spawned from the album, including Wake Me Up Before You Go-Go and Careless Whisper, both of which hit number one in the UK, the US, Canada, and Australia. Freedom, which topped the UK, Irish, and Norwegian charts and went top five in the US, and Everything She Wants, which was a number one hit in the US and Canada. 30 years ago this month, Taylor Dane released her sophomore album, Can't Fight Fate. Although it never reached the top 20 of the Billboard 200, neither did her debut, it eventually achieved double platinum certification by the RIAA, and so did her debut. This album produced her first and only number one Billboard Hot 100 single, Love Will Lead You Back. Preceding singles, With Every Beat of My Heart and I'll Be Your Shelter, both peaked in the top five, while Heart of Stone reached number 12. And in case you're wondering, all four singles from her previous album went top 10. Also released in October of 1989 was Neil Young's 17th album, Freedom. It peaked at number 35 on the Billboard 200 and was his first album to go gold in 10 years, marking a career resurgence for Young after a decade of struggling album sales and chart performance. The album includes one of his signature songs and a live concert favorite, Rockin' in the Free World, which reached number two on the Billboard Mainstream Rock Tracks chart. The other single from the album, No More, also peaked inside the top 10. A quarter of a century ago, hip-hop artist Lucas released his sophomore album, Lucacentric. It peaked at number 9 on the Billboard Heat Seekers chart and generated a modest hit single with Lucas with the Lid Off, which reached the top 40 on four Billboard charts, the Hot 100, the Mainstream Top 40, the Alternative Songs, and Hot Rap Songs charts. It was also a top 20 single in Australia and Iceland. Now, I heard about this album on a long-since-forgotten music show I watched on the FX network called Sound Effects, which uh, among its hosts was a gentleman named Orlando Jones, who's, uh, I think, before and since has been a comedian, uh, primarily a sketch comedian, but I think also a stand-up comedian, and also an actor, I believe. And also, a pre-survivor, Jeff Probst, was one of the hosts of Sound Effects. So, a little trivia note there for you. But yeah, this is one of uh, my few uh, forays into hip-hop that I've actually ended up uh, liking over the years, uh, growing a real liking to it. So, yeah. Check it out if you if you like uh, experimenting with hip-hop. Check it out. Also in October of 1994, Madonna released her sixth album, Bedtime Stories. It topped the album's chart in Australia, making it her fifth number one album there. It peaked at number two in the UK, number three in the US, and number four in Canada. It was certified triple platinum by the RIAA and received a Grammy nomination for Best Pop Album. Lead-off single, Secret, reached number three on the Billboard Hot 100 and number five in the UK, making it her 35th consecutive top ten single in the UK. 
Take a Bow, however, broke that top 10 streak in the UK, peaking at number 16, but it was a number one hit in the US. Both singles topped the Canadian singles chart. October of 1999 saw the release of Leanne Rhymes' self-titled fourth album. It peaked at number 8 on the Billboard 200 and number 1 on the Billboard Country Albums charts, and achieved platinum certification. It consists almost entirely of covers of classic country songs, including Hank Williams' Your Cheatin' Heart, Buck Owens' Crying Time, and Crazy and I Fall to Pieces, both of which were made famous by Patsy Cline. The sole original song on the album, Big Deal, climbed to number 6 on the Billboard Country Singles chart. Also released 20 years ago this month was the Arrhythmics' eighth album, Peace. It was the duo's first album in 10 years, and as of now is their most recent album. It reached number 2 on the German and Swiss album charts, number 4 in the UK, number 8 in Australia, and number 25 in the US. None of the album's four singles charted in the US, but I Saved the World Today gave Annie and Dave their highest charting UK single since 1986. Their follow-up single, 17 Again, peaked in the UK Top 40. Fifteen years ago this month, James Blunt released his debut album, Back to Bedlam. It was a number one album in 15 countries, including the UK, New Zealand, Canada, and Australia, and it peaked at number two in five countries, including the Netherlands, France, and the US. But it didn't achieve that success for seven months, not until You're Beautiful was released as a single. It topped the charts in ten countries, including the US, where it remains his only top 40 single. And it went to the top ten in nine others. Follow-up single, Goodbye My Lover, was a top 10 single in the UK, Australia, and Canada. The album went on to become the best-selling album of the 2000s in the UK. The title, by the way, refers to the nickname of the Bethlehem Royal Psychiatric Hospital. October of 2004 also saw the release of Astronaut, Duran Duran's 11th album. It is their first and thus far only album since 1983's Seven and the Ragged Tiger to feature the classic five-man lineup of the band. It achieved its highest charting in Italy, where it peaked at number two, it also peaked at number 3 in the UK, number 9 in Canada, and number 17 in the US. To date, its only sales certification is gold status in the UK. Its only charting single in the US was Reach Up for the Sunrise, which unfortunately lingered at number 89 on the Billboard Hot 100. An unjustifiably low, in my opinion. But it reached number 5 on the UK singles chart, and was a top 10 hit in Italy and Scotland. Follow-up single, What Happens Tomorrow, hit number 2 in Italy, and was a top 20 hit in the UK and Scotland. Happy 10th anniversary this month to Train's fifth album, Save Me San Francisco. It peaked at number 17 on the Billboard 200, making it the band's first album since their debut, not to reach the top 10. It performed well in Australia, though, peaking at number 8, and in the Netherlands, where it was a top 20 album. It was bolstered by the runaway success, runaway train, get it, of the hit single Hey Soul Sister, which hit the top 10 in 16 countries, including number 1 in Australia, number 2 in New Zealand, and number 3 in the US and Canada. Follow-up single, If It's Love, was a top 40 hit in the US, Australia, and New Zealand. Also released in October of 2009 was Michael Bublé's sixth album, Crazy Love. It spent its first two weeks on the Billboard 200 chart at number one, and stayed on the chart for more than a year and a half. It spent six non-consecutive weeks at the top of the Australian album chart, and was also a number one album in the UK and Bublé's native Canada. Producers on the album include David Foster, Humberto Gatica, and Bob Rock. The title track is a cover of the Van Morrison hit. The album also includes versions of Georgia On My Mind, Stardust, and The Eagles' Heartache Tonight, as well as the original song Haven't Met You Yet, which was a number one hit on the Billboard Adult Contemporary chart, and was the first song ever to debut at number one on the Canadian Adult Contemporary chart. It also won a Juno Award for Single of the Year, and got a Grammy nomination for Best Male Pop Vocal Performance. The album won the Grammy for Best Traditional Pop Vocal Album. October of 2014 saw the release of Jessie J's third album, Sweet Talker. It reached the number 10 spot on the Billboard 200, making it her first top 10 album in the US. It spent four weeks in the top 40 of the UK albums chart, peaking at number 5, and was a top 20 album in 12 other countries. Lead single, Bang Bang, featuring Ariana Grande and Nicki Minaj, climbed to number 3 on the Billboard Hot 100. It topped the UK singles chart and was a top 10 single in 12 other countries. It also received a Grammy nomination for Best Pop Duo group or Group Performance. It also served as the third single on Ariana Grande's sophomore album, My Everything. The hip-hop group De La Soul and violinist Lindsey Sterling also feature on the album. Also released five years ago this month was Taylor Swift's fifth album, 1989. It sold one million copies in its first week, making it the only album to, in 2014 to pass that mark, but also making Taylor Swift the first artist to do so with three of their albums, that is, selling one million copies in their first week of release. 
Uh, as far as its performance on the Billboard 200, well, it spent its first three weeks and five of its first six weeks at number one out of 11 non-consecutive weeks at the top spot. It's only the fourth album since the year 2000 to do that, by the way. Also, it's only the fifth album in chart history to not drop out of the top 10 for an entire year. And as of the time I was preparing these notes, it spent 253 weeks on the Billboard 200, which basically means it's pretty much never left that chart. Oh, and by the way, as if all that weren't enough, it also won the Grammy for Album of the Year. Okay, now let's get to the Spotlight albums, the main event as it were. Uh, I've got two albums for you this month. Well, in a way I've got three because one of them is a double album. But okay, let's just say it for what it is. It's two albums, okay. I admit it. Uh, uh, but they're, uh, one of them is a fairly big album. It's the double album that I'll be mentioning uh, in a minute here. And I'm, I was kind of glad. I'd really been wanting to get a big anniversary album for Backtracks for you uh, in the last few months because it feels like most of this year I've kind of been skimping on and, you know, just going settling for the lesser known anniversary albums. Uh, but of course, part of it happens to be that uh, it depends on what's available at the local stores and how much money I've got. But uh, this one was actually a a serendipitous last minute find. Uh, in fact, I tweeted that I wasn't able to get this album and had to settle for lesser ones, but like two days after I posted that tweet, I found the album. So there you go. It was a, a serendipitous. Actually, both of these albums were kind of serendipitous when you think about it. Uh, so yes, let's go ahead and get to them. Um, I'll tell you the, the serendipity stories, actually. Uh, the first one is Volat, the debut album by Julian Lennon. It is uh, 35 years old this month, released in 1984, October of 84. And I was looking for something else, and I can't remember what it was I was looking for at the time. And this was right next to it. And so I popped it out and looked at the copyright date. Uh, it was 1984. It was a target year. So I decided, okay, I'll get my phone out. And, you know, there was a 75% chance that it, the anniversary date had already passed. But lo and behold, it was an October album, so I was able to pick it up. I grabbed it right then and there. Uh, and it's a, a fairly noteworthy release. Um, I, like most 80s kids, uh, only remember the song Too Late for Goodbyes. That was his big hit single. I think it was his biggest hit single. Uh, and was not familiar with any of the rest of the album. So it was a lot of fun listening to this. And uh, one of the things that struck me by it was uh, that you can really tell by his sense of melody and harmony that he is the son of a Beatle. You know, he's, he's the son of John Lennon. So uh, it's just fantastic uh, album. Uh, just got a great, a lot of, uh, you know, mid-tempo melodic harmonic songs, kind of like the Beatles were fond of doing. Uh, although it does rock out on a couple places, like uh, OK For You is the second track on the album. That's kind of a more rocking thing. But yeah, for the most part, he settles on the mid-tempo melodic type of things, like uh, Too Late For Goodbyes. And uh, another song called, uh, the, the title track of a lot, which opens up the album, that's another really, really good song. And Say You're Wrong is another great track. Uh, that's another single. But uh, yeah, I gotta say, this is a an excellent album. Uh, I really enjoyed listening to it. Was very happy to pick it up and uh, was lucky to find it when I did, uh, just in time for an anniversary album. But yeah, I honestly can't think of a whole lot else to say about this album. I've got a lot more to say about the other album that's coming up. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, produced by Phil Ramone, so I mean, that's gonna gives another testament to the album's quality. Phil Ramone didn't produce crap, so... Uh, at least not that I'm aware of. But anyway, uh, yeah, very, very, very good album. Wonderful. I'm really glad I picked it up, as I said. I probably said already. But yeah, Volat by Julian Lennon, his debut album. Check it out if you haven't yet. And now for the big one. This is one of the biggest Spotlight albums I've ever done. I was really happy to get it because I've been wanting to listen to it for a long, long time. But uh, let's stop wasting time here and get to it. It is 40 years old this month, released in October of 1979. It is Tusk by Fleetwood Mac. Uh, yes, this is the first full album of Fleetwood Mac that I've listened to. Yes, I haven't listened to uh, Rumors yet. I actually picked it up just shortly after I picked this one up. So uh, it, I, I actually do own it now. I, I bought it. It was actually, what, $10, $8? So it was a good bargain. And this was $10. Uh, the um, jacket is a little bit beat up, but the, uh, the uh, records were in fantastic condition, spotless condition. So yeah, it was a really good find for $10, I think. Uh, but yeah... This is a fantastic album. It was it was worth the wait, uh, and the its reputation is pretty much well deserved. Uh, I actually thought it was going to be a little more enigmatic and weird than uh, than its reputation, uh, or maybe what I just read into its reputation. Maybe it's not uh, that reputation, but anyway, very an excellent album, wonderful uh, two L two LP, so it's a double length album, and it's a very good mix of 
what I call classic Mac, you know, the Cla Fleetwood Mac's classic sound uh, from what I gleaned from their singles anyway. Uh, think about me. And uh, that's all for everyone. And never forget our three examples of those kinds of songs on the album. Just, you know, just that classic Fleetwood Mac song that you know about from on the radio. And then there's some some softer, delicate tracks, which I hear was uh, um, one of the major, I th was it Stevie Nicks that uh, wanted to take that direction on the album, I think? I, I read about, I read up on it, but I can't remember exactly. But uh, yeah, Over and Over and Storms and Walk a Thin Line are three of the superb examples of the slower, softer, del more delicate tracks on there. And then also there were some punkish influences, and that was what I uh, understand was another influence by, was it... Uh, Mick Fleetwood or Lindsay, I think it was Lindsay Buckingham that wanted to go in the punkish kind of direction, kind of the post-punk influences. A few songs of that ilk on here, The Ledge, and uh, Not That Funny, and That's Enough For Me, and I really, really enjoyed those songs, and I'm not a punk guy, so, but uh, yeah, just those Fleetwood Max take on punk, I guess, was really good. It kind of turned me on. Fantastic. And of course, you've got the weird, almost progish influences. Uh, particularly on the songs What Makes You Think You're the One, and of course the title track, Tusk. You know, it's like, you know, a marching band, you know, in, in a, on a pop record, you know, what the hell kind of weirdness is that? But hey, it's su insanely catchy, and of course one of their signature songs, the title track, Tusk. But yeah, this was a fantastic album, one of my favorite Backtrack Spotlight albums of all time, one of my favorite listening experiences in quite a while. But uh, so, yeah, I mean, you you most likely have heard this album by now, but if you haven't, I highly, highly recommend it. I pretty much can't recommend it enough. Uh, and I will be spinning this a lot uh, from now on. I can, it's going to be one that I'm going to come back to regularly, I'm pretty sure. And it's all, making me all the more eager to finally listen to Rumors, which I actually spent money on. So it's like, hey, listen to it already, huh? But uh, yeah. So yeah, Fleetwood Mac, Tusk. Uh, don't be surprised if this ends up in the top spot of my favorite Backtracks albums of the year list at the end of this year. So yes, yet another winning crop of Spotlight albums for yet another month of Backtracks that is coming to a close. I hope you enjoyed it, uh, this celebration of Backtracks for October 2019. And that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, suggestions, questions, constructive criticisms, lay them on me in the comments section below. Also, scroll down to the description for the link to my Twitter feed and links to my favorite fellow YouTubers who are all worth checking out. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel and browse my past videos, and be sure to ring that notifications bell so you'll be the first to know each time I drop a new video. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time, and remember, life's too short to be a music snob.